Welcome. You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast, the show that cuts through the fog of war and updates you about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts. Hello, I'm Marina Yevshan, co-host of the Russia-Ukraine War Report Podcast, and today is March the 25th, 2024. It has been 3,710 days since Russia started covert military operations in Crimea, 10 years and 34 days since the start of the Russia-Ukraine war, and 2 years and 31 days since Russia expanded its war of aggression. Today's podcast looks at events that happened over the weekend. During the podcast you will find the Russia-Ukraine war map helpful to visualize the areas discussed. A link is in the podcast description, and there are map updates. The Russia-Ukraine War Report is compiled by our team from around the world. Today's report includes information from our direct contacts and journalists in Ukraine, the Russian Ministry of Defense, the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine Morning Reports, Operational Commands North, South and East of Ukraine, Open Source Intelligence, our in-house team of analysts and geospatial experts, and pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian male bloggers and social media channels with a track record of trying to be accurate. We have one mission, the truth, because the truth matters. Here is my daily assessment. 1. In our assessment, Russia is taking advantage of US inertia to restart its campaign to destroy Ukraine's electrical infrastructure. 2. The continued disjointed response to Russian aggression by Ukraine's allies continues to embolden Moscow, resulting in another violation of NATO alliance airspace on the night of March the 23rd. 3. In our assessment, the March 22nd terror attack in Moscow was executed by ISIS-K, with no assistance or involvement by any other nation. 4. In our assessment, the ongoing fighting between Free Russia Liberation and pro-Putin forces in Belgorod and Kursk the missile and drone strikes in Russia and occupied Crimea, and the terror attack in Moscow have exposed how Russian defensive capabilities and internal security forces are stretched too thin. 5. In our assessment, the filing of a motion to vacate against Speaker of the House Mike Johnson and the April 19 resignation of Republican Congressman Mike Gallagher has created a window of opportunity that could move U.S. military aid for Ukraine forward. 6. The preordained election of Vladimir Putin has cemented his rule for life as a de facto dictator, and he will continue to dismantle 70 years of political and social reform from the Soviet and post-Soviet eras. This is the last day for this entry. 7. Ukraine continues to systematically target Russia's oil refining capability to cause economic harm and degrade Russian mobility. 8. Based on statements made by Russian President Vladimir Putin and his proxies, and the actions and inactions of Ukraine's allies, the world remains in the early stages of the mutually assured destruction and stability paradox. 9. Russian missile attacks over the last week have confirmed our assessment that Ukraine's air defense capabilities would be in a critical state by April due to a lack of munitions. 10. Russia maintains the initiative theater-wide, but the second phase of the 2024 winter offensive is reaching its culmination point. 11. Ukraine's shift to a Fabian strategy to wear down Russian combat power continues to be effective. 12. Russia has significantly improved its intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities, ISR, and fire control, enabling more successful attacks against mobile targets. This is the last day for this entry. 13. While the possibility of an intentional nuclear accident caused by Russian occupiers at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant remains low, the condition is more serious than what the International Atomic Energy Agency is reporting. We begin today's war report in Kharkiv and Luhansk oblasts. The operational tempo remains low in the Kupian's carry of operation, or AO. Russian sources reported continued fighting in the area of Sinkivka with no change in the situation. On Saturday, Russia hit the city of Kharkiv with more S-300 anti-aircraft missiles used for a ground attack, targeting electrical infrastructure. The two attacks, with the largest on Friday, completely destroyed the city's electrical infrastructure. Mayor Igor Terehov reported that even the thermal power plant was destroyed. Quote, 
there is no answer to the question of how long the restoration work will last. Repair crews are working, but the destruction is very serious. Unquote. Power and heat have been restored to 40% of the city. Despite the grim assessment over the weekend, metro service was restored on Monday, but on a reduced schedule. For the parts of Kharkiv that have had power outages, rolling blackouts will continue. In the Kremenayo of Luhansk oblast, Russian forces made continued attempts to advance on Terne from the east without success. And in the Siversko, Russian forces continued their attempts to advance on Belohorivka from the northeast and southeast, also without success. Here's what's happening in the Donbass, starting in northeast Donetsk oblast. Over the weekend in the Bakhmut Dio, Russian forces intensified their efforts to advance on Chasiv Yar. Russian troops were able to advance east of Bogdanivka in the direction of Kalinina. Russian troops had advanced into this marshy lowlands previously, but were unable to consolidate their gains. If they can't make a rapid advance to the top of the ridge on the eastern edge of Chasiv Yar, they will be forced to fall back. Within Ivanivske, intense fighting continued, with Russian troops making marginal gains. In the Klishivka EU, positional fighting continued north and east of Klishivka, with no change in the situation. Russian troops also made repeated attempts to advance on Andreevka from the east and suffered significant losses. In southwest Donetsk oblast, Russian forces made additional advances in the Avdivka EU, but overall progress is now measured in meters. Fighting continued on a line from Berdeche to Semenevka, east of Umanske, and ending on the western edge of Tonenke. On Friday, Ukrainian forces withdrew from the western part of Tonenke, with nothing left to defend. To the south, fighting continued in Pervomaiske. Russian forces were pushed further south and east of Nevelske. The heaviest fighting in Ukraine continues to be in the Vuhladaryo. Russian assaults continued east, northeast, and south of Krasnohorivka, where Russian troops were able to take control of the mine shaft complex. Russian assaults east of Georgievka and on the southwestern edge of Pobeda ended in failure. The situation in Novomikhailovka deteriorated again, with Russian troops consolidating their gains in the eastern part of the settlement and linking up with the troops holding the city council building. The map has been adjusted, and Russian forces now control the eastern half of the town. In the Staromlinivka EO, Ukrainian sources reported continued fighting in the areas of Staromayorska and Dorozhaina, with no change in the situation. In Zaporizhia oblast, the intensity of fighting dropped in the Urikhev EO. Russian forces fought positional battles to the west of Verbove and west and south of Robotene. Engineers stabilized the Dnipro hydroelectric power plant dam in Zaporizhia and were able to reopen the road that crosses the structure. There has been no additional information shared about the amount of damage to power units 1 and 2. In occupied Melitopol, the main defense intelligence directorate of the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, UHUR, working with local partisans, attacked a column of Russian troops. Two Kamas trucks and a Patriot MRAP were destroyed, and there were up to 20 Russian troops killed. We could not independently verify the casualty claim. The International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, provided an update on the status of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, ZNPP. On March 20, Russian occupiers at ZNPP notified the IAEA that planned maintenance to some of the safety systems was being delayed due to the, quote, general situation in the plant's surroundings. IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi expressed frustration, saying, quote, Routine maintenance work on the safety systems of Reactor Unit 1 was first delayed when the ZNPP last month lost the connection to its only remaining backup power line. After the 330 kV line was restored last week, the plant had intended to resume this work and conducted the necessary preparatory tests before it decided on Wednesday to postpone it again. Unquote. IAA inspectors reported the sound of ongoing artillery and machine gun fire from areas outside the ZNPP perimeter. Monitors were able to walk through the six main control rooms and inspect the feedwater pumps and tanks of Units 1 and 6. 
no leaks of water, oil or boric acid were reported, indicating that issues with two of the four reactor safety systems have been addressed. The team was also permitted to inspect turbine and maintenance hall 5, but were restricted from seeing all areas. There was no update on staffing levels, the status of the reactor roofs, the reconnection of radiation monitors, or whether Rosatom would honor the repeated request by the IAEA to walk through turbine and maintenance halls 1 through 6 in a single inspection. Local reports indicated that on March 24, power to the 750 kV line to ZNPP was once again disconnected due to a Russian attack in the Krivirich area of Dnipropetrovsk oblast. Engineers were able to repair the damaged line and restore power. It was very busy in the Black Sea, occupied Crimea, Mykolaiv and Odessa regions. On the evening of March 23rd and 24th, Ukraine launched a significant missile attack on occupied Crimea. A video recorded overlooking Sevastopol showed six missile heads in three areas and several interceptions. At least three French Scalp E air to surface cruise missiles hit the pre 2014 Ukrainian naval headquarters, which the Russian Ministry of Defense was using as a communications center. Satellite images from Planet Labs shared by the United States news agency Liberty Radio confirmed the strike, showing significant damage to the roof of the building. Satellite images also showed that two Project 775 Rupuha-class large landing ships were hit at their Sevastopol moorings. It is believed the Azov and the Yamal were struck, with satellite images showing one of the vessels being towed to a dry dock, potentially leaking fuel. The strikes on the vessels were confirmed by Russian mill blogger Sutins, independent analysts and naval experts Benjamin Peter and H. I. Sutton, and the Minister of Defense of the United Kingdom Grand Chaps. Neither vessel looks irreparable. The March 23rd strike extended Ukraine's successful attacks on the Black Sea Fleet to 10 vessels in the last eight months. In our assessment, unless Russia can strengthen air defenses or find a way to move the remaining undamaged ships trapped in Sevastopol to Novorossiysk, attacks will continue until every Russian Black Sea Fleet vessel in the port is destroyed. At least one Skalpy cruise missile struck the fuel depot in occupied Gvardiyske, destroying three of the 14 storage tanks at the site. Russian sources also claimed that three Su-27 multi-role aircraft were damaged at Belbek military airfield. And the combined attacks killed 34 Russian troops and wounded 40 more. We could not independently verify the report of damaged aircraft or Russian casualties. The IEA reported that on Friday, one 750 and one 330 kV external power line were disconnected at the yuzhno ukrainsk nuclear power plant north of Mykolaiv. Other external power lines remained connected, but power output was reduced until the 750 kV connection was repaired. On March 23rd and 24th, Odessa and the Neub River port cities were attacked by Shahed-136 one-way drones and Russian missiles. Port and electrical infrastructure was damaged, causing renewed rolling blackouts. Power was briefly restored, with Russia striking energy infrastructure again in a follow-up attack. On the night of March 24th and 25th, Odessa was attacked a third time, causing additional damage to the electrical infrastructure. Trains and trolley service have been suspended, and certain industrial facilities have been requested to remain closed. Rolling power outages are expected to continue. As for the rest of Ukraine, in Dnipropetrovsk oblast, rolling blackouts will continue in Krivy Rih due to additional attacks by Russian missiles and drones on March 23rd and 24th. The tech reported that, quote, some equipment at one of the substations, as well as a high-voltage transmission line, was damaged by falling debris, unquote. Russia launched up to a dozen cruise missiles at the Lviv region, with multiple hits recorded at the Naftoha storage facility. The gas storage tanks are deep enough not to be affected, but the surface infrastructure was heavily damaged, sparking a large fire. 
On the night of March the 23rd and the 24th, Ukrainian air defense intercepted approximately a dozen KH-101 and 555 cruise missiles in the Kyiv region, without any significant damage reported. Missile debris was found in several parts of the city. In the early morning of the 24th, a Russian KH-101 or 555 cruise missile launched from a 295 MS strategic bomber violated Polish airspace for 39 seconds. It was the third incident in six months, with the most recent breach on December the 29th. Poland has scrambled F-16s fighter planes in coordination with Ukraine, as the missiles were tracked heading toward the Lviv region. Shortly after the incident, the head of the Polish National Security Bureau, Jacek Siewiera, wrote on Twitter, also known as X, quote, The Allies were also informed about another incident of a violation of NATO's border by Russian Federation military assets. The Minister of Defense of Poland, Władysław kosiniak kamysz explained that Poland would have intercepted the missile, quote, had there been any signs that this object was heading for a specific target located on the territory of Poland. The spokesperson for the operational command of the Polish Armed Forces, Lt. Col. Jacek Goryszewski, added that the missile was traveling at 800 km per hour and flying at an altitude of 400 meters. Poland summoned the Russian ambassador, demanding an explanation about the latest violation. Shevera later posted on Twitter that NATO must change its stance on how it defends the alliance's airspace, and that in the future all Russian missiles should be shot down. Moving to assessment. The repeated violation of NATO airspace by Russia, as well as GPS jamming in Romania and the Baltics, is a direct result of Ukraine's allies' continued appeasement of Moscow and autocrat Vladimir Putin. We have repeatedly assessed and continue to maintain that treating Russian aggression through a rules-based Western lens only encourages further Russian aggression. Putin translates appeasement as weakness. We find it inexcusable that the NATO alliance continues this soft approach, given that if one-way drones or missiles violate a nation's airspace, the nation has every right under international law to take reasonable measures to protect its interests. The only way Poland and Romania will stop violations of the airspace by Russia is through a zero-tolerance policy. If NATO and the European Union leaders truly believe that Russia now presents an existential threat to European security and stability, then the time has come to start acting like it. Otherwise, it's just empty words, similar to as long as it takes. Let me ask a rhetorical question. If NATO's rules of engagement include that if a violation of their airspace that doesn't pose a direct threat to their assets is able to proceed, what exactly is stopping Ukraine from targeting the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad? You're listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. Our team of journalists, researchers, and analysts is funded by readers, listeners, and viewers just like you. To support independent journalism, please consider becoming a patron. You can find us on patreon.com at Malcontent News. It was extremely busy on the Russian front. I want to start with a brief disclosure. Not to report on the terrorist attack that happened in Moscow would be journalist misconduct. But we also don't want to overfocus on the incident. Our editors decided to go deeper into the incident in today's podcast because there is so much disinformation being spread. Also, today's Russian Front section contains graphic details of human rights abuses that are not meant for children to hear, and some may find disturbing. On Friday, at least four terrorists aligned with ISIS-K attacked the Krokus City Hall music venue and mall in Moscow. At the time of recording, 137 were reported dead and 182 wounded, with 112 in hospital. The attack comes after the March the 7th warning from the United States Department of State of an imminent threat of terror attack on Moscow. The bulletin, following the duty to warn protocol, advised U.S. nationals to stay away from concerts and large gatherings through March the 9th. 
Canada, Germany, Sweden, South Korea, Latvia, the UK and the Czech Republic issued similar warnings. On the same day, the Federal Security Service of Russia, FSB, announced it had prevented an attack on a Moscow synagogue by eliminating an ISIS-K terror cell from Afghanistan. Also, on March the 8th, Russian propagandist Margarita Simonyan, the editor-in-chief of Russia's state media agency RT, said that the US and the UK would be complicit in any further attacks if they don't share, quote, specific information with the Kremlin. And as recently as March the 19th, Russian autocrat Putin dismissed the warnings, calling it a plot to destabilize his government. In the days that followed the attack, Russian state media and the Kremlin have struggled to connect the attack to Ukraine while avoiding blaming ISIS-K. Russian state media TV channel NTV released a deepfake video created using AI, claiming to show the Secretary for National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine, Oleksiy Danilov, confirming Ukrainian involvement in the attack. And the deputy chairman of the Security Council of Russia, Dmitry Medvedev, blamed Ukraine within minutes of the first news reports of the incident. After ISIS-K claimed responsibility through an official Al-Qaeda channel, Simonyan dismissed the claim because an older graphic template was used. ISIS-K released two more statements, including one with a photo of the attackers repeating that they take sole responsibility. Nineteen hours after the first reports of the incident, Putin addressed Russia, claiming that security forces had intercepted a white Renault van and captured three of the four attackers. Almost immediately after Putin's statement alleging that the terrorists were trying to reach Ukraine, the ambassador of Belarus to Russia, Dmitry Krutoy, said during an interview, quote, The head of the State Security Committee is in direct contact with his colleague, and in fact the main task last night was to prevent terrorists from crossing our common border. Such a task has been accomplished. Unquote. The place where the van was stopped was geolocated 16 kilometers from the border of Belarus, heading northwest away from Ukraine toward the Russia-Belarus border crossing at Jastkova Gornya. All of this is to say that every attempt Moscow has made to shift the blame to Ukraine has been instantly undermined by others sharing the truth. One of the alleged terrorists was brutally tortured by Russian state security forces, who shared a video of their actions. The man was beaten, restrained, and then they cut off his ear and forced him to eat it. A second video showed another alleged terrorist being interrogated in the emergency room of a hospital with a broken nose. On Sunday, a picture was released by Russian security forces showing a third alleged terrorist with the wires of a field telephone connected to his genitals. Russian soldiers call this form of torture, quote, calling Putin using the field phone to generate a strong electrical charge. With the Kremlin continuing to try and blame the attack on Ukraine, ISIS-K released a fourth statement, including a 91-second video showing four terrorists conducting part of the Moscow attack. A few hours later, there was a fifth statement, including the release of two more videos. On Monday morning, the four alleged terrorists appeared in the Moscow State Court with clear signs of torture and abuse. Two already pleaded guilty, and the four will be held in pretrial detention for 60 days. If you cut off someone's ear and feed it to them, or hook someone up to the equivalent of a portable car battery, you can probably get them to confess to almost everything. Hey, ABC News Australia, your puff piece about the noble Russian soldiers you released last week aged like room temperature milk. Moving to assessment. In the aftermath of the attack, clouding the information space was always the intent of the Kremlin. If Moscow admits the attack was carried out by ISIS-K, Ukraine no longer becomes the singular manufactured threat to Russia's existence. It also exposes a well-known fact. While Russia is an authoritarian police state, those resources are internally focused on the Russian people, not external threats. Russian intelligence has had repeated blunders in its war of aggression against Ukraine. This includes missing the September 2022 Ukrainian troop buildup that led to the Kharkiv counteroffensive, the April 2023 assassination of Vladlen Tatarsky, and not recognizing the June 2023 Prigozhin insurrection until private military company Wagner Group had already taken over the city of Rostov-on-Don. 
Putin and the Kremlin cannot escape the overwhelming evidence provided by ISIS-K proving they executed this terror attack and are reliant on useful idiots to create competing narratives. This is an attempt to deflect the incompetence of Russian security forces and Putin's rejection of the warnings provided by eight countries. In reality, the autocrat who wants to be a Tsar has no clothes. On March the 23rd, in the Samara region, multiple Ukrainian one-way drones struck the Rosneft Kuybyshevsky refinery near Novokuybyshevsk in two waves. A geolocated video showed a drone striking the ATV-4 distillation tower with no Russian attempts to intercept it. Local Russian leaders confirmed the refinery, which can process 7 million metric tons of crude oil a year, was offline, and the distillation tower was damaged. Up to 10 Ukrainian one-way drones struck the Novocherkask State District power plant in the Rostov region. Two of the eight coal-fired power units were knocked offline, and a third was damaged. A substation was also damaged, de-energizing the 330 kV power lines. Along the Russian border in the Sumo oblast of Ukraine, the VKS, Russian Aerospace Forces, dropped three bombs near the village of Paramoha in the Bilopilia rayon, damaging power lines. The cross-border shelling between Russia and Ukraine was significantly reduced over the weekend. Here's what we could confirm in the Kursk and Belgorod regions. In the Kursk region, there was little information released by either combatant, with only reports of positional fighting continuing in the border area near Tetkina. In the Belgorod region, fighting continued in Kozinka, with the Russian state media team briefly entering the northern part of the village before speeding away. The Free Russia Liberation Forces did not release any statements over the weekend, but there were no claims about a withdrawal from Gorkovsky. We've left the map unchanged. The shelling of Belgorod entered the 13th day, with the State Technological University dormitory head wounding six. In May 2023, students complained that Russian troops were using the dormitory as a barracks and were harassing students. Here is my theater-wide update. On the evening of March the 22nd and the 23rd, Russia launched 33 Shahed-136 one-way drones and four S-300 anti-aircraft missiles used for ground attack at Ukraine, with 31 drones intercepted. The next night, Russia launched 29 KH-101 and 555 air-to-surface subsonic cruise missiles from 14 to 95 MS strategic bombers and another 29 Shahed drones. The Ukrainian Air Force intercepted 25 UAVs and the Navy intercepted two more. 18 of the 29 cruise missiles were also intercepted. On Sunday night, Russia launched nine more Shahed-136 UAVs at the Odessa region, with eight intercepted. Since March the 20th, Russia has launched 148 missiles and 135 Shahads at Ukraine, almost all of them targeting electrical and civilian infrastructure. The tech reported that just on March the 22nd, half of its electrical generation capacity was destroyed. The head of Ukrainergo Volodymyr Kudrytsky said that the electrical grid had suffered at least $110 million in damage. President of Moldova Maya Sandu called the latest attack, quote, disgusting and inhumane actions against the civilian population. In another troubling sign that Ukrainian air defenses are exhausted, as of March the 23rd, the VKS had dropped more than 2,000 fab bombs of various configurations, a new record with eight days left in the month. The next part is for the 57% of our listeners outside of the United States. The U.S. House and Senate completed passing the fiscal year 2024 budget, almost six months after it was due. The budget did not include supplemental funding for Ukraine, Israel or Taiwan or humanitarian aid for Palestinians. Shortly after the House approved the budget, Congressperson Marjorie Taylor Greene followed through with her threat to file a motion to vacate against Speaker of the House Mike Johnson. Greene did not file a privileged motion, which would force Johnson to put the motion to a vote by April 10th, and told the Associated Press, quote, It's more of a warning. 
Green could let the motion die or, at any point in the current legislative session, introduce a privileged resolution, which would force a vote within 48 hours. Frustrated by the continued dysfunction, Congressman Mike Gallagher, a Republican from Wisconsin, announced he would resign on April the 19th. The date was a strategic calculation on his part, as Wisconsin law will leave the seat vacant until January 2025. When Gallagher leaves, Congress will be split 217 to 213, shrinking the Republican majority to one seat. Under House rules, a vote on a bill fails if there is a tie. Ironically, House Republicans insisted that COVID-era rules for remote voting and proxy voting be eliminated. As of April the 19th, if a single Republican congressperson can't show up to a critical vote, Speaker Johnson won't have a majority. Speaking on the Sunday weekend talk show circuit, Johnson and his surrogates indicated that a bill to provide Ukraine with military aid would be put to a vote when Congress completes its Easter break. The next session won't be until April the 9th. The 2024 budget that passed on March the 22nd does include $300 million in USAID money that could be used to provide another one-time tranche of military aid to Ukraine as a bridge through April. The International Monetary Fund chief for Ukraine, Gavin Gray, told reporters that the next $800 million disbursement to Ukraine has been approved. Gray also noted that the Ukrainian economy has demonstrated remarkable resilience in 2023, despite the ongoing war and martial law. The Netherlands pledged to provide Ukraine with another $2.2 billion in military aid in 2024, with $270 million allocated to the Czech Republic Ammunition Initiative. Estonia announced another military aid package for Ukraine, which includes 155 mm ammunition, anti-tank weapons, explosives and small arms ammunition. The Czech Republic is transferring its last two Mi-24 hind attack helicopters to Ukraine. Also, Australia announced it was joining the Latvia and UK-led Ukrainian drone initiative. Jakub Janowski returned to his work on the Oryx database after an illness and announced that Russia had lost more than 15,000 pieces of heavy equipment since February 24, 2022. That's based on visual confirmation, with the real number estimated to be approximately 22% higher. And that's what we know. Your support of my home, Ukraine, helps us make history and protect the future for all. You've been listening to the Malcontent News Russia-Ukraine War Podcast. To help keep us independent, please consider providing financial support by becoming a patron. Want on-demand news in your hand? Download the Google News app and make Malcontent News one of your favorites to receive breaking news updates. Thank you for listening.